Hello, my name is Kurt and welcome to my God Day. And today I want to speak about the love revolution that we all need to experience in our lives. One of the first times, even after I became a Christian, where I spent, where I, I experienced, let's say, a full scale revolution of love was when I was in Baptist the Theological College in Johannesburg in South Africa. And we all 40 students went away to a camp. And I remember we were taking communion together and we were praying. And we had people from every different political persuasion. We had different colors as well. So some of the black people were praying for their boys, the freedom fighters, whom some of the Afrikaans students called terrorists. And then you get the picture. So what was happening, we were taking communion, celebrating you know, the death of Christ for us, the forgiveness of sins. And then we are almost getting into a political revolution based on hatred and our differences. And one guy suddenly says, let's just stop this and ask the Holy Spirit to come. So, you know, sometimes that can be a bit of a cliche experience, but literally the Holy Spirit really did visit us in so much love that there was a love revolution in our hearts. And I remember one of the black students who was full on African National Con Congress and one of the white students who was the most kind of conservative right winger you could get just embrace and they hugged and the walls of separation of hostility broke down. Now, that's what I call a love revolution. And I wanna ask you and even ask myself, have you experienced a love revolution in your life? And I found this story on the internet that really impacted me. And it's a young man who was battling with addiction, but also a young man who frankly hated himself. I was reading some statistics lately, and, and in my country, in America, one of the um, things that's driving people to suicide and despair and depression is self-hatred. It's just simply self-hatred. People who do not know how to love, value, or appreciate themselves. Okay, and it goes like this. He says, I spent years addicted to drugs, alcohol, sex, and relationships because I hated myself. And he uses a bad word. These coping mechanisms kept me from putting guns in my mouth for a while, but they eventually stopped working. When I entered the rooms of recovery, when he went to a recovery center, they told him something that he did not expect. They told him this, let us love you until you learn how to love yourself. Let's just slow down in the story and take a bit of a break. Let me read that again. Let us love you until you learn how to love yourself. And we've heard that expression where it says you can't love anyone else until you love yourself first. But what if you're battling like millions of people in my country? to try to value, appreciate, accept, and, and love yourself. And you look at yourself in the mirror and you just say, wow, I wouldn't even recommend myself to, to, you know, for a relationship with any of my friends. That's what I think. And the critical inner voice is just telling you how bad you are. And you're lis listening to your old man, old woman, more than you're listening to the new man or the new woman in you. What do you do? Sometimes you have to allow people to love you, but what if there are no people to love you? And, and, and Jesus understood this predicament very well. And that's why he says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. Isn't it interesting? We need a revelation of that love. That's why the apostle Paul prays that together with all the saints, we would have the power the dynamic power to grasp the dimensions of his love. And I'll speak a little bit more about that later. What about 1 John chapter 4, 7 to 8? Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. So back to that statement, you can't love 
anyone until you love yourself first. In a sense, it's true. I mean, yes, you cannot transmit something you don't already have. How can you love somebody else if you don't know that Jesus loved you, if you don't have that love in yourself, even for yourself? You can't transmit something to somebody else you don't have. So the above statement seems logical, doesn't it? But the false assumption is that self-love is the starting point of the journey of loving others. It's not true. The starting point is really is this. We love because God first loved us. Now, let's go back. Oh, I love this. This is what one psychologist, Bruce Perry, writes. He says, the truth is you cannot love yourself unless you have been loved and are loved. The capacity to love cannot be built in isolation. I remember speaking to a young lady. Ooh, she came into our church and very pretty, you know, in her 30s, young girl. I guess I'm 63, so young, and all dressed in black. And, you know, sometimes because I'm a pastor, people like to shock me, okay? And she's telling me all about her sexual experiences with men and going on and on and on and on. And then I look her in the eye. I think it's good to make contact. And I said, okay, I hear this, but have you ever allowed yourself to be deeply loved by another person. Shut her down. Stopped everything. She just realized that she has a deficit of love. She, it's about performance, about, it's about something else. But she had never allowed herself to be deeply loved. So I think we love because he first loved us. And we have to allow. I think the problem is, as many times we don't think we're worthy or we're up to scratch. So we think that we don't deserve the love of God. So we put up our coping mechanisms and our first force fields. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But back to this, this guy in the, in the um, okay. So anyway, they told him, let us love you until you learn how to love yourself. And so he says, that ragtag bunch of weirdos <laughs> literally saved my life by bringing me into the fold and showing me unconditional love and acceptance. These strangers became the surrogate family I always wanted and filled the gaps left by my traumatized family members who were constitutionally incapable of meeting my developmental needs. Once, he goes on, I attended a workshop where I sat in front of a room and everyone just showered me with statements of love, appreciation, admiration, compliments, and affirmations for at least five minutes. I ugly cried so hard I started to wonder if they would run out of nice things to say about me, but they didn't. They just kept loving me until the mounting evidence of my indisputable worthiness and lovability became too overwhelming to contest. It's like shame and self-loathing suddenly became obsolete in the presence of such powerful expressions of love and belonging. Love is powerful. I remember it was Dr. Marsha Linehan. She is one of the top psychologists in America. She specializes in border, borderline personality disorders. And she shared in a post when she was a young woman in her 20s, she was in Chicago, she was suicidal. She went into a chapel, she was a Catholic. And she was just sitting there contemplating taking her life. And then a nun came up to her and said, can I help you? She says, nobody can help me. And then after the nun left, she looked up at the cross and she said, this is a psychologist, 76 years old, reporting this to the New York Times of all papers. And then she said, suddenly when I looked at the cross, this shimmering light, this love, this overwhelming presence of God, you know, came into me. She didn't use that words, but it was a revolution. And she could get up and suddenly say, I love myself. So she gets up. And she just goes in front of a mirror and she says, I love myself. She says, I've never done that. I never even used a personal pronoun about myself. I knew, you know, even though I was suicidal, I had problems. I knew that God could get me through this 
and that I could help other people as well. You see this, another story, Catholic priest, Melanie and I just, I just finished doing a wedding in Granada here in Spain. And we were driving away and Melanie had the radio on, or we had the radio on to Radio Maria, you know, uh, Radio Maria, okay? And I was just about to turn it off, but there was somebody speaking, it was a Catholic priest, and I said, hold on, hold on, no, 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 no. don't turn it off. There's something in this guy's voice that, that, that's different from any voice I've ever heard in my life. And so, anyway, it's all in Spanish, and it seems that this priest was from probably Colombia, let's say he was from Bogota, Colombia, and he had been abused terribly. I'm not going to even go into the details. What you can imagine, the worst thing you can imagine, had happened to that young boy. And at 10 years of age, he left his house, became a street kid, gangster, murderer, drug dealer, and he vowed never to cry again. He vowed never to become vulnerable, never to put himself in a position where others could hurt him, so he hurt other people. He was walking down the street, say in Bogota, Colombia, a voice says to him, get on that bus. <laughs> and he's trying to say, no way. But it was a pretty powerful voice, you know, you know, get on that bus. So he gets on the bus. Three stops later, the voice says, get off the bus. So he's fighting the voice, but he can't. It just overwhelms him. So he gets off and says, go into that building. So he goes into Catholic church. He's the only one there. When he goes in, it says it was like the sun itself came into the room. And even though I had vowed never to cry again, I couldn't help it, just like a baby. And as I cried, all the hatred, all the memories of abuse, everything just went out of me, and I was filled with love. Now that is a love revolution. That's something that happened in Dr. Marshall Linehan, something that happened in this young boy. Immediately, not immediately, but a little later, he went to his father, his abuser, that he always feared. And the same thing happened to his father, the same revolution. Then he went to his mother. The same thing happened in his mother's life. You see, this is why, you know, we're not fighting against people. We're fighting against principalities and powers. But love, wow, love is, love is strong. It's more powerful than we can ever imagine. So six ways, briefly, we can experience a love revolution in our lives, because I want the same revolution in my life. Number one, God's revolutionary love completes us. It makes us whole. It makes us better together. First John chapter 4, verses 11. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. Think about this. I know prayer is very powerful. I know giving thanks is very powerful. But if we don't love each other in a qualitative way, this says we're not going to be whole. We're not going to be perfect. We're not going to be complete. Maybe that victory, that completeness that's, that we've longed for, it's not going to happen unless we start loving one another. So in short, you must surround yourself with healthy, mature, nurturing connections. Okay? This is why fellowship is so important. You ever wonder why, oh man, I've spent so much time alone with God. And you just don't feel whole sometimes. But when you're together with other people, uh, experiencing God in community, many times it's so much more powerful. Number two, <clears throat> God's revolutionary love is revealed, not earned. Okay, let me say that again. God's revolutionary love is revealed, not earned. I have a friend, he's in the UK, he might be listening right now, Keith Simpson, and this is his testimony. He came to Christ, I think, when he was in his 50s, if I'm not mistaken, you know, a very important man in the UK, and he says this, I walked into Park Road Baptist Church, anyone from Park Road Baptist, hello, with my wife, and knew virtually no one, and none of the hymns they would sing. 
but in the singing of what I have since learned was Charles Wesley's famous hymn, And Can It Be? I was contemplating a small wooden cross on the communion table. When they arrived at the verse, my chains fell off, my heart was set free. Hey, beginning of a revolution. And my life changed in an instant, in seconds. I was bowled over but by what I can only describe as a tsunami of love that physically knocked me over an experience of joy and bliss. So imagine you're sitting next to Keith. He's knocked over, you know, below the pew, just screaming out in joy and bliss. That sounds like a pretty good revelation to me. I believe this joy cannot be experienced other than in reconciliation to God and from which you can never recover as you are absolutely born again. 1 John chapter 4, 9 to 10. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Do you know something about love? When do you think, when is the word love first mentioned in the Bible? I mean the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is a, not a trick question. When, you know, God is love. So when is the first mention of the word love in the entire Bible? Okay. You recognize the story. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. That's the first mention of the word love. And go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering, offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. How could God do this? That's the whole point. How could God ask Abraham to sacrifice his son that he so loved, his one and only son that he so loved? Does that remind you of something? We'll get there just now. That's the whole point. Isaac wasn't killed, was he? Jesus died, didn't he? So in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when do you think this word love first occurs. Okay, so the first of the first you in all three of these Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it occurs when God says, this is my beloved son at Jesus's baptism. First use, this is my son whom I love. Okay, so it's, it's kind of setting us up for God so loved the world, which of course comes in John 3, 16. So when we view this context, it says, for God so loved the world. That's the first use of the word love in John's gospel. God wants to overwhelm us with the so, for he so loved the world, in which we feel so loved. And, you know, after God says that, the first person that Jesus meets that's named is the Samaritan woman at the well. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, and the Father sends Jesus to this woman at the well that he, 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 he crosses, you know, racial lines, gender lines, religious lines, cultural lines, just to show how much God loves the world. I love this, um, God's revolutionary love. Three, God's revolutionary love unblocks our hearts. This is three. God's revolutionary love unblocks our hearts. Dan Ellender, he's a psychologist. He wrote a book called The Wounded Heart, and it goes like this. He says in the preface, the introduction of his book, my eight-year-old daughter once asked me, Daddy, why are you interested in sexual abuse? Thankfully, before I could answer, she asked another question. Daddy, do abused people have walls in their hearts that keep them from being happy? And will they have less bricks in their walls after reading your book? 
And of course he broke down in tears. So insightful, you know, his eight-year-old daughter. And so many of us, we have blocked hearts. I'll give you a perfect example, you know. For example, I don't know, say I've met women who have had relationships with men that, that have all ended in disaster. They've all been toxic. And as a result, one woman, the first person I met in Bar Marbella was a, a, a woman. And she said to me, you know, it's just my dog and I, because I've been so let down by men right now. So I blocked my heart off. I'm hardening them. I'm never going to have a relationship with a man ever again, but I love my dog. <laughs> and I think there's so many people that fit that correct, uh, where we've we, where we've blocked our hearts to one thing. And if you block your heart to one thing, you're going to block your heart to everything else as well. So Jesus', Jesus is revolutionary love unblocked Peter's heart, who allowed himself to be deeply and thoroughly loved. I think many of us fit into this category of Peter. And, you know, here Jesus is, and he wants to demonstrate. It says in this passage in John, it says that uh, Jesus wanted to show the full extent of his love to his disciples. And he wanted to communicate just the necessity of love and what it looks like in the real world. So Jesus decided, hmm, okay, we're having dinner tonight, very important dinner. We've spent a lot of money, a lot in the preparation, etc. And of course, my disciples are going to come in with dirty feet, okay, because they're wearing sandals and someone needs, needs to wash their feet and their, their ankles. And usually it would be the lowest person in the ladder, okay, in the pecking order, the servant. They would wash the feet. But in this case, you know, the host of the meal himself, Jesus, gets down, puts on um, a manner of dress that identifies himself as very lowly, a servant physician, and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. It's just, it's just crazy. This is unheard of. You know, maybe like John and James, you know, the disciples are fighting who's going to be the greatest, et cetera, you know, and hey, you have to wash my feet. John, no, James, you have to wash my feet. And then Jesus says, hold on, I'm the greatest amongst you, but hey, I'm going to wash your feet tonight. And so Peter looked at Jesus and said, you'll never wash my dirty feet, never. But Peter, Jesus said, if you don't allow me to wash your feet, then you will not be able to share life with me. So Peter said, Lord, in that case, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head too. So what are your dirty feet? What's blocking you from, what are you ashamed of? What are you hiding? You know, we imagine Jesus coming through the front door of our life, but what about the back door that maybe you haven't opened that leads to a room in your house that's, that's messy. That's where Jesus wants to come through. Number four, God's revolutionary love compels us to love others. And I like 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 to 15. And this is from the Passion Translation, okay? It's kind of like a paraphrase, but it hits the mark. For it is Christ's love that fuels our passion and motivates us because we are absolutely convinced that he has given his life for all of us. This means all died with him, so that those who live should no longer live self-absorbed lives, but lives that are poured out for him. The one who died for us now lives again. So Jesus was able to love others in a deep and profound way because of his habit of connecting with his father every day. You see, when we allow Jesus into our lives, when we allow him to wash our feet, to love us deeply, then that love compels us to love others. There was a point where I was threatened by people. I didn't really love people as much as I do now. I do hundred, I've done hundreds of funerals, weddings. I don't get nervous because that love compels me just to make a difference in people's life. I remember I was at a friend's birthday party and he doesn't think too highly about himself. 
So we got together for a whole hour and just told him. We just bombed him. We caused a love revolution in our lives. We just told him how valuable he was to us. And then in turn, his wife had been maybe critical of him in a few things. Suddenly his wife said, whoa, man, I really love my husband even more. That's a new way of looking at him. Number five, God's revolutionary love conquers. Okay? It conquers. It says in Romans 8.37, now in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And there it is. A lot of times people just shout out, we're more than conquerors. We're not the tail. We're the head. You know, we're conquerors. Yes, we are. But the feel of that has to be the person who loved us. We're more than conquerors through him who loved us. Number six. We experience God's revolutionary love through communion. And this is so important. I go back to that story when we had communion together, Baptist Theological College, you know, opposites on the political spectrum. People were dying. It was very serious. It was a life and death. There was tension. There was hatred that was being released as we were preparing for communion. And then one guy invited the Holy Spirit in, and then it caused a revolution in all of our hearts. It, it, it was so noticeably different. It, it, you couldn't explain what happened. Just like that psychologist, Dr. Marshall Inham, couldn't explain how the love of Christ came into her. Just like that young gang member, you know, went to the church, couldn't explain how suddenly so much love came into him that he was compelled to go to his abusers and the same revolution happened in their lives. So this is why we celebrate communion. And Father God, we thank you so much for your love that conquers. We thank you so much for your love that sometimes we don't want to receive. Help us to take out all the bricks and fully open our hearts so we can experience a love revolution in our own lives. Well, thank you so much for being with me, for sharing this God's Day, and I hope and pray that you will experience that same love revolution in your life. And uh, thank you for being with me and hope to see you on another occasion. Goodbye. Shalom.